Martha Hennessy. First of all, I'd ask, is there any legal reason why sentence cannot be imposed at this time? Any what reason? Legal reason. Um, you have cited that we did not specifically connect some of our defense to your court in terms of Nuremberg laws. Right. In your mind, no. In my mind, yes. Okay. And what would that be? You're saying that there was no public harm done, and I think that we're forgetting about what's happening on the other end with this drone use, and that's what my concern is. No, the power is in your hands. Okay, are you going any statement you wish to make? Yes, I'm here to reclaim my humanity and hoping that other people in this room can feel the same to reclaim their humanity in terms of the war crimes that are occurring. And I think the best that I can do is to continue with this effort and I certainly will do so, and I'll, I certainly will also continue to do the simple acts that I do regarding care of the poor. And I think the speaking out is probably everyone's last hope. Claire T. Brady. Yes. Is there any legal reason why a sentence cannot be imposed? record should reflect that Ms. Grady is indicating that there is no legal reason. Do you wish to make a statement? Not at this time. Okay. record should reflect she does not wish to make a statement. Mark Scavelia uh, Carver, any uh, wish to make a statement? Yes. Yeah. First of all, is there any legal reason why a sentence cannot be pr proceeded this evening? Well, perhaps, because I don't think you failed to note that for the defendants who were arrested on the Town Line Road gate, we were, I think, at least two-tenths of a mile within the private property of the base. So we weren't, was, the public element wasn't there, in my mind. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, so... To attain the good of peace, there must be a clear and conscious acknowledgement that violence is an unacceptable evil and that it never solves problems. Violence is a lie. It goes against the truth of our faith, the truth of our humanity, the truth about Jesus. Violence destroys what it claims to defend, the dignity, the life, the freedom of human beings. What is needed is a great effort to form consciences and to educate the younger generation to goodness, to nonviolence, to love. That was a message for a World Day of Peace from Pope Paul, John Paul II. Um, the truth is that it is impossible to interpret Jesus as violent. Faith and violence, that was um, Pope Benedict, and this is Pope Francis now. Faith and violence are incompatible. Faith and violence are incompatible. There can be no religious justification for violence in whatever way it manifests itself. <coughs> to say that one can kill in God's name is blasphemy. This is a poem by David Smith, who visited our refugee camp in Kabul in 2010. It has come to this. Young American women and men, mainly from poor families, trained to kill, paid to kill, equipped with sophisticated weaponry, and shipped to foreign countries, kill innocent children and adults, mainly illiterate, often people who never met an American before. We call this fighting for democracy and national security. Before we met Khalid, before he reached like a parent into a pocket of his robe, before his hand emerged with worn photos of his children lying there, torn, bloody, dead. 
before the first assault of shock and horror gripped our throats and shook us like rag dolls, squeezing the air out of us, before he told us <coughs> that an American missile destroyed my home and killed my wife and five children. We knew that he was waiting for us in Afghanistan, that he had left the lowland green fertility of his farm, his goats, his village in Helmand, left all but the memory of his wife and children, <clears throat> and come with his cousins to this brown, dusty, barren refugee camp to live with nothing but a tent between him and Kabul's mountainous winter. We knew that others had come before him and others follow. We knew that alarming numbers of American soldiers home from Afghanistan would beat their wives, abuse their children, kill themselves. We knew this before Khalid's bearded face and the broken faces of his children looked at us. Before the start of US military operations earlier this year in Helmand province, before Barack Obama ordered a surge of troops, before the first US troops arrived in Afghanistan in October of 2001, we knew. I would only add as a faltering disciple that the judgment I am most concerned with is the last one that I will face, which Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 25, where his persona, the Son of Man, is the judge. At issue in this judgment will be whether or not one has taken action to do the works of mercy in responding to Jesus' suffering when he was hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison. When those being judged wonder when they have seen Jesus in these situations, Jesus identifies himself with the least of these brothers of mine. This is why Christians speak of seeing the face of Jesus in the suffering poor. How we treat them is how we treat Jesus. Not responding to relievable human suffering merits eternal punishment, the most severe judgment. Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement in something called her Union Square speech in 1965 said, we are not performing the works of mercy, but the works of war. We cannot say this often enough. Who in today's world do we find among the least of these brothers and sisters of Jesus? Certainly, those living under drones in our ever-expanding imperial war zones can qualify. Bombed, terrorized, exterminated, they are denied the status of persons. From us, they experience the opposite of the works of mercy. Millions have been made hungry, thirsty, and homeless in the last 22 years of our unjust wars of aggression. Those executed by drones have not even had the benefit of a mock trial that Pilate afforded Jesus. Many are reduced to bug splat by our bombs, a dehumanizing term coined by drone pilots for their victims when all that is left are blotches of blood, bones, and viscera viewable on the video screens. This often makes it impossible for any surviving relatives to perform the last work of mercy for their loved ones, burying the dead. How do I think the just judge will respond to my responsibility for such an appalling lack of mercy if I should do nothing to resist these crimes carried out in my name that are illegal by the minimal standards of international law and unthinkable by the higher standard of the gospel? How could I not join my friends in the witness and action at DeWitt's drone warfare attack base? We cannot go back often enough to say these same things. So impatient have we become for a new springtime of justice and peace, a profound change of mind and heart that will produce actions of mercy instead of war. Thank you. No. And is there a statement you'd like to make? Yes. Uh, there's two two issues I like uh, two things I like to say. One is just that I feel that uh, though we may have sh fallen short on the formalities for the defense uh, related to international law as it's embedded in federal law and protected by state. Uh, the state justification statute that uh, that the argument is valid and should be pursued further 
And in that light, I'm not sure if this is the right time to say it, but I would like it that any sentence would be um, deferred until such time as uh, we can follow, or I can follow through with an appeal. Thank you. Anything further? No. Okay. Thank you. Ray Kramer? Does Kramer any legal reason why his sentence cannot proceed? Uh, other than the point that Judy just made, it seems kind of odd for a sentence to take place before an appeal. So other than that, no. And just to, to let you know, there are provisions to do stays for county court. Um, I don't have any notes, and I, uh, in thinking about that, I um, thought about the past trials that we've been involved in here, and I've made light of the fact that my predictive abilities are so abysmal. Uh, clearly, part of me believed that you would find us not guilty, and therefore I have no statement. Uh, so that self-delusion certainly doesn't help me for the moment. Um, I wonder about an imposition of a sentence of 15 days in the, in the county prison. Uh, some of us have done portions of that, have survived and survived well. In fact, uh, in some cases, have begun to make friends and relationships with people that we met there. The most significant outcome of the action on October 25th, 2012, was the issuance of the order of protection. As I spoke in my closing statement, I find it hard to be my usual calm self about this. I believe it is such a twisting and distortion and corruption of the law that a statute that was intended to protect people from intimidation and threat and harm is being used precisely to keep us away from the base. In none of the paperwork that we have ever seen prepared or generated by the county, the state, the town, has there been one iota of information provided by the base that in any way shows that any person was intimidated, threatened, or harmed. We, in fact, made jokes to you about I wouldn't even know if Earl Evans was standing next to me at the deli line. I don't know what the man looks like. The only thing I do know is where he works. So the only piece of fact included in that order of protection is that I need to stay away from where he works. And the end result of that is to deprive me of my First Amendment rights. I'm also feeling a little uncomfortable here in the sense of the, the unequal levels of power. There are more things I would like to say to you, and I feel a little bit intimidated about sharing my thoughts completely because I'm not the person who's meeting out the sentences. Um, I found it continually surprising the posture that you've taken to invoke your discretion as the justification for reissuing the order. And the reason that was so surprising to me is I think that you have shown extraordinary patience and tolerance and allowance of our novice status in the field of law. You have been, I think, amazingly decent to us and have really extended to us the intent of the law, which is to provide an opportunity for fairness. I, I can't jibe that with your participation in what I think is a mockery, and namely the ongoing institution of the order of protection. It was an enormously clever ploy by the base. If you look at the data about the people who have been participating, showing a presence at the base, of the approximately 50 people who have been arrested, only four have chosen to risk contempt of court by going back with an active order in effect. It was an awfully clever move on the part of the base. The base needs to know, though, that our energy will be equally directed to, in a substantive way, not a procedural way, dealing with this order of protection. If, 
In fact, we are sentenced to 15 days or whatever that turns out to be at Jamesville. Um, in my case, it will make my husband happy because it will be 15 days that I don't smoke. Uh, if you're interested in dieting, the food is so abysmal that you will surely be successful in losing some weight. Uh, and as I said, it gives us a chance to connect to people that we might not connect to otherwise. So there is no great trauma about going to Jamesville. It really falls much more into the order of inconvenience. The other thing it does, though, is that it fuels us, I believe, and hopefully it will fuel the people who are supporting us in adding their bodies to the presence at the base, especially while the order of protection mockery is still in effect. Um, again, I, I thank you for your decency to us, uh, and I'm only sorry that you will not be the groundbreaking, landmarking judge who has the courage to move beyond disorderly conduct and trespass and help us make manifest the intention of the Constitution, which is that we all live decent, safe lives. Um, thank you. Daniel Bergman, do you wish to make a statement? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. First of all, is there any legal reason why your sentence cannot proceed at this point? Uh, I don't know whether my health has anything to do with the, with the actual uh, punishment merited out to me, but I, as I mentioned earlier in, in previous day in this trial, I have a letter uh, explaining my particular medical condition. Be glad to present it to the court. Okay. okay. Sorry to hold it and it's been sitting in my car for a while, but. But, um, well, hold up. People uh, are going to have to see a copy also. Okay. Aside from that, uh, uh, it seems a justice, uh, a sort of a lopsided justice when uh, something. Hold up. Oh, okay. Thank um, you, pardon. Are you uh, okay with me letting the district attorney see it? Sure. By all means. Likewise, I have a prescription based on this particular condition, which requires, uh, I mean, I don't have the prescription with me, sorry, but I, I do have a prescription to Zocar. And I have the, the medication in my pocket, but I don't think it'll get past the gate if I go to, uh, to jail at Jamesville. And you're gonna mark this court's exhibit too. And aside from the cost of putting me in a jail for 10 days, I would be more than willing uh, to do 25 hours at least of community service in an underserved community within the city of Syracuse or DeWitt. I would be more than happy to do that. Is there a statement you'd like to make? Yes, there is. Brief. Uh, Your Honor, thank you for your fairness throughout this entire proceeding. Uh, I have nothing but respect for um, you as, as a man and, and a fair judge, I think. Um, we are on the brink of a new era in human development. The ability of the United States to create death and destruction anywhere on Earth while never leaving our own nation is a grave breach of disorderly conduct. Unfortunately, this new frontier of empirical warfare has created a secret cabal in our elected executive branch that seriously undermines our system of checks and balances woven into our founding principles as a nation, a democratic nation. The Central Intelligence Agency, the executive branch, and the Pentagon not only hold many sovereign nations, nations hostages to drone, war, drone violence, but have co-opted and violated our own rights as citizens in this country who seek a peaceful diplomatic solution to international problems. The war on terror, by proxy, 
made us terrorists, murdering innocent citizens at will, anyone, anywhere, anytime. This ability assures wars without end, profit for war makers, and tyranny for the rest of us. With these grim prospects for our nation's future, we can only do what we have done on October 25th, 2012. We are the hemoglobin of peace and justice pumping into the sickened heart of a nation gone astray. God help the United States of America. Thank you. Any legal reason why a sentence cannot be imposed at this time? Uh, no. Any statement you'd like to make? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Judge Gideon, for giving us the breath. And I, I do want to uh, say I especially uh, feel that you were very um, patient with me as I was trying to bring in Francis Boyle. And so thank you. And I learned from some of my co-defendants about some of the things that I said, like, can you do me a favor? <laughs> so I apologize for my unknowing um, how to proceed. But um, I do feel, um, well, I, I do want to bring in the voice of the victim that I cut short on the story the other night in the closing. So, so I'll just start by saying on the eve of that first trial back in 2011, uh, the drone strike that killed, um, well, there was a drone strike in Pakistan that killed 16-year-old Tariq Aziz and his 13-year-old cousin as they drove to the soccer game. And I want to just share a little bit that Tariq was loved by many as a brother and as a cousin, as a friend and also as a son. And he was the best defender on his soccer team. He had just returned home from a huge publicly announced open gathering um, called a jirga, but it's, it was like a huge conference about drones in the capital city of Islamabad, meeting hundreds of people uh, at, with internationals, uh, with the press, with community members who were outraged that U.S. drone strikes had killed their families. And Tariq's cousin, Asmar Ullah, had been killed uh, also in a drone strike. So Tariq came to this gathering in Islamabad because he wanted to help in a simple way. He wanted to try to stop the killing by taking a, a camera and taking the photos of the drones that were flying over his village and then downloading the photos and then somehow documenting what was going on to document the war crimes. And because uh, of this, he was targeted and murdered by the drone, as I said the other day. So the Hellfire missile that assassinated him burned both his body and the body of his cousin, and it was almost unrecognizable. So at, his, at Tark's funeral, his brother said, oh God, what has happened to us? There's no happiness, no gatherings, not even soccer. Happiness has disappeared along with Tarek, and we are mentally tormented. And because of drones, innocent people die. And we have a saying, let me be buried with your photo so that I can't forget you in heaven. So looking at the patterns of drone strikes in Pakistan, Cora Courier of ProPublica states that the US has no capture policy uh, for drones, I mean, of, of people, denying people um, any due, due process, so the drones are used instead. And there have been, as you've heard in this courtroom before, three to 4,000 people that have been killed by drones, not just in Afghanistan, but in other countries, and only a handful have been captured. So according to British attorney Clive Stafford Smith, the legal director of the human rights group Reprieve, who was with Tariq at the gathering in Islamabad, he said, it was obvious that Tariq was not a terrorist or an extremist. 
He was somebody who was traumatized by drones. A very intelligent high school boy with a great sense of humor, someone who loved playing soccer with his friends. And you can watch this and you can see Tarek playing soccer and I shared with you that watching the film Unmanned, America's Drone Wars, is, and I think you've been given the copy, I would pray that you do take some time to look at that film and you'll get a better sense of why we have all been here and will continue to be here. So they say that um, there's no intelligence on the ground. This is Sty um, sorry, Clive Safford Smith saying this. There's no intelligence on the ground to uh, find out who's the terrorist, and you rely on local people, and they're working for money. So in the case of Tarek, you know without any dispute that there was a US intelligence paid informant in the room at the gathering who picked out Tarek to be targeted. And the way you know what intelligence they, the government, relied on to target him was by what they reported in the news. They said four militants were killed, and two boys were killed, and Tarek was one of them. So as I had said before, killing him, killing Target, Tarek, and also his cousin has not made us any safer. Thank you. Mark T. Colville. First, I'd ask if there's any legal reason why a sentence cannot proceed. No. Any statement you'd like to make? Yes, I, I have a little statement. Um, well, first of all, you, you have passed judgment tonight. You've passed judgment on us. Um, but more importantly than that, um, you've passed judgment on yourself and on this court. Um, this court has been found guilty of stopping up its ears against the laws which are applicable, not only applicable, but binding and superseding law in this court, namely international law and the laws of necessity. You found the court guilty of stopping up its ears against the cries of those for whom the law is intended to defend, those who are the, the weakest and most vulnerable among us, and those who as responsible citizens, which we all uh, have demonstrated that we are, uh, stand up and raise a voice against injustice. Um, you found this court guilty of, of participating in the fascist project that this nation has become, um, accelerated since 9-11 uh, uh, of uh, 2001. Um, you, you had an opportunity to um, to stand in the way as we stood in the way in front of that gate against the crimes that, uh, that you know because of the testimony that you've allowed here, that the crimes that you know are, are going on behind that gate. Um, so you have found the court uh, guilty. Um, and now you, you're faced with another uh, opportunity, another challenge uh, from where you sit. And that is, uh, and I, I would like to personally, uh, first of all, I, I unite my, myself and my conscience to everything that's been said in the statement so far. Um, and now I want to say something personally uh, on my own behalf. And that is that if you believe that justice has been served here, if you believe that the people that this court needs to defend have been defended here, um, I invite you to, and I, I, I actually uh, urge you uh, to take an act of conscience and sentence me to the, to the most severe penalty that, uh, that is allowed. Um, if, you, if you believe that, uh, that justice has not been done here, if you believe that the law has failed uh, to, to, to defend those who most need to be defended by this court, then I invite you to sentence me to nothing. Um, I, I don't think in between is a stand that uh, you or I 
am in a position to take anymore at this moment in history. And so I would invite you to examine those two uh, perspectives, either uh, don't sentence me to anything or sentence me to the, uh, the most severe penalty possible. Thanks. <clears throat> First, I'd ask, is there any legal reason why a sentence cannot proceed this evening? There is no legal reason. And any statement you'd like to make? Uh, yes. First of all, um, I want to... Uh, thank uh, yourself and, and, but particularly the rest of the persons in the court, um, the guards uh, and the people whose title I don't know, but I, I greatly appreciate, uh, I greatly appreciate um, the humanism uh, that they bring to these proceedings and uh, it touched me very personally and I want to extend that, the, the remark to them. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, so thank you. Thank you uh, also um, to the People's Council, Mr. McNamara. We appreciate, appreciate your earnest efforts. Um, I wish they'd been less successful. Um, uh, and then in, in, as regards a statement, if you remember from my testimony, um, I was trying to outline what I perceive as a, as a crisis created by this program by the, the, the drone program prosecuted out of Hancock. And, and that, that program, uh, I, won't, I won't review it at, at length, but because, because we are fighting, prosecuting wars in violation of our own laws, uh, that, that this court and the dutiful observance of people at Hancock uh, are at a crisis with persons like myself who are trying to observe in good conscience the, um, the, the laws under which our, our society operates. And those laws are rooted in the demos, in the people. And, uh, and I would say as a sentencing statement, um, taking a page from Mark's book, um, Mark Coville, who spoke just before me, that, um, that this crisis is, is frustrating, perhaps, frustrating to do it, um, and maybe inconvenient to us, um, but, but the crisis serves a purpose. And so I would, I would urge you, in, in slightly different language, to allow that crisis to be. And, and so if you can um, acquit, my, I guess I'm speaking only for myself here, if you can, so you can't acquit me, uh, you're a trier of fact, I have no objection to that, but um, in terms of passing judgment, uh, you, should, you should sentence me to nothing in the interest of justice, recognizing that this crisis is a crisis, or you should sentence me to the maximum, again, recognizing that this crisis is a crisis, and allow it in that way to speak for itself. And I'll say just once more quickly, thank you so much to each of you, and I appreciate your time and, uh, and good service to your communities. Good night. Thank you. Elliot E. S. Adams has exercised his Parker privileges and has been excused and has agreed to sentencing in absentia. Uh, Patricia P. Wheeland, I almost said it wrong last time. Got it right. Last time. <clears throat> Any legal reason why sentence cannot proceed this uh, No, Your Honor. Any statement you'd like to make? I just, I, I want to just note that. In my testimony, I noted that, um, that I don't operate thinking about legalities often, but rather from a, a position of morality, and that, that I, I experienced in this courtroom, uh, certainly by your example and that of, of everyone here, a willingness to, to allow those dimensions of morality to enter into our testifying, into our presentation of our case. Um, and I can only hope that as you have heard cases before and undoubtedly will again, that, um, that they have um, an increased meaning for you as to why we who could be perceived as uh, unrepentant recidivists, um, that in fact we are dedicated 
and, uh, and are operating in a realm that is quite possibly um, allowed to be in the courtroom and to influence you and the courts. Thank you. First of all, I'd ask, is there any legal reason why sentence cannot occur a season? I have no idea. N none from my end. Any statement you'd like to make? Yes. I'd like to begin with a quotation from the late constitutional scholar Ronald Dworkin. Dworkin once argued that, quote, a citizen has a moral responsibility not only to form convictions of one's own, but to express these to others out of respect and concern for them and out of a compelling desire that truth be known, justice served, and the good secured, unquote. I would argue that judges are also citizens and have similar responsibility. I would further argue that while judges, indeed all citizens, have a moral responsibility to express our convictions to serve justice and to secure the common good, we also all have the responsibility to act on those convictions. Acting on our convictions is exactly what the 17 of us did at the Hancock Reaper drone base on October 25th, 2012. I have a few qualms about accepting whatever legal maximum prison sentence you have the power to impose. After all, any such penalty, any such power can only be trivial compared to the death sentences the drone chain of command, totally without due process, imposes on non-combatants in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other Islamic countries. Regarding this court's custom of not only incarcerating citizens, exercising their civic responsibilities, but levying onerous fines on them, I can find no discernible link between such penalties and justice. Nor can I see any link between this court's penchant for issuing orders of protection for the safety of already exceptionally well protected Hancock based commanders, men themselves deeply complicit with the drone killing machine. A killing machine vaporizing and otherwise obliterating innocent human beings. Indeed, were I a judge, I would charge you, sir, with contempt of judicial process for having imposed these surrealistic orders of protection and for having allowed yourself to be co-opted by that killing machine. Sir, you and I both know that according to the Article 6 of the Constitution, international law trumps both local and federal law. You surely have sworn to uphold that Constitution. So it's likely you have studied the U.S. Constitution and constitutional law. But to refresh our memory, let me quote Article 6. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding." Unquote. I believe that in finding us guilty of disorderly conduct you have chosen to ignore your oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution. Some have, some have died defending that Constitution, a Constitution I value, but far higher in my mind than even heeding that document is Ronald Dworkin's standard of the common good and the standard of justice. And by those standards, I believe your verdict has failed. Thank you.
Gainesville Rick Jr. Firstly, Mr. Riggs, is there any legal reason why Simmons cannot proceed this evening? Um, I have a bad toothache, Your Honor. Very, very, very bad toothache. And I don't think that they would give me the proper medical attention in the penitentiary. Um, any statement you'd like to make? Yes, there is. Um, yes, yeah, a little difficult. I feel you're, you try to be fair. It's hard for me to thank you for finding me guilty of um, something that was explained to me before I ever arrived here and in this courtroom as performing my duty as a responsible citizen, and I believe that, that it was my duty to try to stop um, extrajudicial killing uh, that was taking place at that base. And let me, I did write something, I'd like to read it. Um, Judge, Mr. Jordan McNamara, and all the court staff and uh, my co-defendants. Glad to be here tonight. Um, trying circumstances, but um, I said it maybe a month ago, I believe that we did the right thing 16 months ago and whatever happens to us after that is just gonna have to happen. I never did understand the Hancock 38 decision when you inexplicably inexplicably, as far as I was concerned, found us um, uh, guilty of um, performing what I still consider my civic duty. I um, have yet heard how this is considered an illegal act, but let me uh, read my statement, please. It took me a minute to write it. And actually, I had to write it on the way up here I was not even considering uh, being found uh, guilty. I thought we had prevented, uh, presented a pristine case. And uh, someone told me, write a sentence statement just in case. So I'll say at least I get to say this one more time. These proceedings are taking place on stolen Onondaga land. And this is something that we need to uh, understand. With all due respect, I watched a closing statement that consisted of a silent, disjointed, out of context film supplied by the very people that we accused and indicted with our people's indictment. Um, the film and comments that were presented in the closing statement um, suggested that our intention was to block the gate and not to engage the base personnel. Upon our arrival, base personnel closed the front gate. While we were uh, portrayed as standing in the front line blocking traffic, we, we were out of the way. There was no way any cars could proceed. The gates were closed and locked upon our arrival. I think the picture was taken out of context. It was placed up there with everybody uh, standing in a straight line. That might have been 2 or 10, 15 minutes out of a two-hour stay. We had engaged the personnel. We, had a, we walked up to the gate and spoke to them. We told them there were crimes being committed there that needed to be stopped, that we wanted to indict uh, the bait, them, their commander, and the chain of command. All of this took place. None of this was on that film. And I was sitting next to a defendant. I mentioned this, and I said, well, the judge is going to go home and look at the whole film and realize that this short little piece is just put up to try to uh, uh, support what the DA was uh, uh, trying to accuse us of it. Within two hours, I'm sure we could have found a segmented piece where we were actively engaging the police and, and made our case. Um, I also felt that the, um, some of the points you made about evidence that we didn't present um, could have been alleviated if, if uh, we had an expert witness uh, explain these things. Um, it gets rather complicated, and although, like Packy said, I feel, as she does, that we were morally correct, but after speaking with 
of Ramsey Clark. And I did have a chance to speak with him personally. And I've looked at all the emails with all these in the information and amicus briefs about international law and judicial discretion. It seems like you have the right, if you want to, to decide on this matter and to decide if our, um, of these international law uh, arguments and, and the, the addendum for judicial discretion, you know, uh, informs our intent that we, we should come here and we should speak out against that and come here to court and explain to you uh, 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 our rationale and reason for going there. Um, we, are com we are completely convinced that there are war crimes being committed to here. We didn't come to block traffic. We didn't come to cause public annoyance or alarm. Um, if, there were, if the streets were empty, we were going to that gate to uh, uh, charge those people with committing uh, war crimes. And as I understand even now, that it's my duty to do that. And, and if you can explain to me how it's not, um, I'd be more uh, uh, comfortable with this sentence. Um, if I could finish this. Um, this film was supplied by the very people who we were indicting. Uh, the base personnel. We engaged them for an hour or more. When the police arrived, we told them that there were crimes being committed at that base. They disregarded us. They spoke to the very people we were accusing, uh, maybe because we have been there before. And even that term, um, it, was, it was used as an accusation. Oh, you've been here before. Yeah, I've been here before. They have been killing people at that base and they continue, and I'll be here again, either after I go home or after I go to jail and get out, as long as they're committing crimes at that base, an extrajudicial killing, to kill somebody without giving them a chance to defend themselves, it's just common sense that that's not right. I don't care if the United States Army does it or anybody kills somebody uh, without giving them a chance, even if they're a, um, an official agency to execute somebody without giving them a chance to even defend themselves is um, it's extrajudicial killing. And you, of all people, should rile, it rile up against uh, uh, something like that. Um, yeah, that term, the term that you know we, we've been here before, um, as though it was an accusation, it's an honor. It's an honor to me that I've been here before. Uh, to stop illegal activities and obvious violations of international law, war crimes, torture, extrajudicial killing. Um, I told you, Judge, on a subsequent arraignment that I, could, I did not understand of the first conviction with no consideration for our much more serious charges. They were illeg illegally killing people according to expert witness Ramsey Clark and other expert witnesses that we tried to bring in, Francis Boyle, Mary Ellen O'Connor, and the illustrious uh, Chantel Thomas uh, from Cornell, all international and constitutional law scholars. From reading their work brief, works briefly and speaking with some of them, um, it gave me an understanding that number one, that there were major crimes being committed at Hancock, and that number two, you, Judge Gideon, have the judicial discretion to consider as a valid component to our intent, our real understanding of crimes being committed at that base by the powerful and our duty to somehow halt it. You should have found us innocent, but you can still pull a rabbit out of your robe, sir. Um, Restorative justice is what I have in mind. Sentence us to investigate the crimes we're accusing them of committing. Order them to give you the justification for what appears to be illegal activity. You're the judge in the community where they rent that base. Shouldn't you know what's going on there? Or sentence us to community service to investigate allegations, order us to investigate, we will. Order them to let us in, they won't. 
order them to let you in, they will not, I think. Transparency and accountability are the checks that are needed on the executive when they transgress legally. How can a justification be judged as legal or not if it's secret? It's surreal, Judge. This is surreal. We have the, the government, the President of the United States and the CIA telling us that they're killing people. It looks like it's illegal, but we have a secret understanding for doing this. And I said it in my uh, testimony. Um, that's not only troubling, it's, it's mind boggling. It's hard for me to believe that intelligent people are sitting here swallowing this that they're killing people, it, it appears as though we're afraid to stop them. That's what it looks like. They're doing it, not hiding it that well, and it seems like uh, the entities that were created to put these people in check when they transgress those bounds uh, don't seem to work. I mean, they're not even uh, being investigated, and we would be glad to as a sentence, and it would take some time. And probably, and I say this, it's a bit ludicrous because I know they're not going to let us in there. They're not going to let anybody look at what they're doing, and that should be uh, telling us in itself. And um, I just say so, uh, uh, that community service will, will, will gladly uh, be fulfilled, and uh, we would like, um, if possible, with his uh, comprehensive analysis and his perception that almost borders on clairvoyance to have Mr. McNamara join us in the investigation. Um, at least uh, as you sentence us uh, for trying to save lives, and this is very important because it's, we're talking about again disorderly conduct and, well, trespass was uh, dismissed. And um, it's hard to sit here and understand I'm getting ready to be sentenced for something. I didn't come here with any mens rea. I didn't have bad intentions. I didn't try to call public annoyance, alarm, or whatever. I tried to get to that base to tell them to get right where they would have to deal with me and tell them they're committing crimes and somebody check out the validity of what we're uh, trying to, what we're trying to uh, uh, bring to light. And, um, I'm just wondering, when do they ever have to explain what they're doing in there? We're here explaining our behinds off. When do they have to explain? You now wish to make a statement, Ms. Grady? Claire T. Grady? Any way? Well, I just wanted to ask him if at the very end I could uh, make uh, Another statement because I just I'll give you a brief opportunity, but thank you. Go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> My father, John Peter Grady, always said that it, the best education you'll ever get will be in a courtroom. Thank you, James Ricks, for um, leading us through that, speaking truth about this, um, and taking the veil away for most of us. Um, I. Uh, I come here with this computer, my sister's computer, about a week or so ago, I got an email from our friend Felton Davis in New York City. Uh, many of us, Felton uh, sent us a transcript, sent us news about a judge that just died at the age of uh, 99, I think it was, in New York City. Judge Honorable Millard Medonic. And he sent this news to us because many of us had gone before Judge Madonic back in 1998, and Felton sent us the transcript from that trial. So um, that trial stands out here today for me because we were charged with disorderly conduct, state of New York uh, violation charge there. Uh, and at the time, we there were about 20-something of us that had gone on Ash Wednesday and gone under a police barricade to the U.S. mission during the time of the U.N. imposed sanctions on the people of Iraq, where there were thousands and thousands of Iraqi children under the age of five dying at the hands of U.S. imposed sanctions. So we went under the police line. We were charged with disorderly conduct, and we went before Judge, Judge Millard Madonic 
on April 22nd, 1998. There were many, there was a spokesperson uh, assigned for the group or chosen for the group. Um, now, I'm sorry, I'm not a computer person. Here we go. I want to bring attention to, um, toward the end of the, our time before the judge, where he got to hear about why we would go to the U.S. mission, why we would go under a police line, why we would not uh, obey the police order to uh, not go under the police line. And people brought forward uh, personal testimony about how they had been to Iraq and seen the suffering and knew firsthand uh, the result of our U.S. policies. And the judge asked at one point, um, so a woman named Sybil Sender, before Sybil gets on, um, a man named Mr. Jones speaks about how he watched a video uh, that the former Attorney General Ramsey Clark had made showing the conditions in the hospital in Baghdad, showing no medicine on the shelves, showing children suffering needlessly. There was a portrayal of genocide against innocent women and children, and he watched the McLaughlin Group, a right-wing television show, and Robert Novak, who never makes any sense, use the word genocide and saw Diane Sawyer interview Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, and when asked if 500,000 children were an acceptable price to pay for the uh, US, maintaining US policy in the region, Madeleine Albright said yes, that it was an acceptable price. It was not too high of a price to pay. So then the judge thanked people, uh, Kevin Jones, for his uh, testimony. And then Mrs. Sender comes forward and she says, I want to plead guilty to the death of 500,000 children. And the judge asks her her name and address. She gives that to them. Uh, and she thinks that um, she would use stronger words than her co-defendants and that she wants to remind the judge of the laws that came out of Nuremberg trials and that she, that she wanted to remind the court of the silence of much of the Christian church during the Holocaust of the Jews in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. And she wants to remind the court of the book Hitler's Willing Executioners. And she says, I was a little girl then in America and I saw the movies of the US forces going into the labor camps the concentration camps. And I said, well, how could the grown-ups let this happen? And now I am a citizen of a country that is murdering people silently in Iraq. And if I don't have the guts to dive under a police barricade for those people, and if people hadn't the guts to break the laws to end slavery in this country, where are we, where are we? So this is not uh, just a matter of breaking laws, I would say but uh, the guts to step over the line when the police say, stay there. Um, so Sybil says, I'm guilty of going under a barricade. But the judge says, I understand you. As a matter of fact, there is a provision in criminal law that I'm authorized in a proper case to say, in the interest of justice, that you are all perfectly innocent and that you're trying to tell me, I think, and you're very persuasive. I'm very much moved by your remarks. He goes on to dismiss the case in the interest of justice. Judge Millard Madonic. And um, I know that that is not an appeal. There's no opinion written about that. But I wanted to bring that into the education of this courtroom for all of us, not just you, Judge Gideon. Um, and my closing remarks would just address your assertion that we were there to rattle the chains or something like that. And I would say that we've said it again and again with our words and our bodies, that we go to Hancock to stop the war crimes of our government. And I don't think that can be said more clearly. And thank you very much.
Thank you, sir, for allowing me to come back up. I, I think uh, being first is really hard for me because I'm still reacting in my mind to, uh, the, to what you said rather than uh, coming forward with what I think. Which, uh, and I want to say that when I uh, brought up the idea of an appeal, that uh, it may seem um, that it's kind of a vanity in a sense in this context. And, uh, but I want to say that I do believe that these issues are so important and that the people that uh, are suffering from this are so, uh, so significant and that the importance of these issues to the people of this country, to the people who are involved really without their knowledge and understanding of what is going on here, that all these things uh, require uh, a persistent response. And that uh, I understand that, as I say, that our formalities were not necessarily in order, but I also understand that uh, there must be a way to put them in order and a right person to engage on behalf of these issues. And that is, and so my sense of an appeal is not necessarily a criticism of this court, but rather uh, a using of the full system of justice and a, an engagement, not use, but engagement of the full system of justice, just the way uh, we came here, you know, we went to Hancock to engage with the people at the base. Here we're engaging with the courts. This is the checks and balances. We've, I've had conversations with Dan Maffei, Congressman Dan Maffei, about this issue myself and with Congressman Louise Slaughter when I got shifted to her domain. So uh, this is a, a, an all-out uh, initiative to try and address these issues, and I, I hope that you understand that and that if I speak in terms of technicalities, that the same passion drives me that drives the people who uh, speak more eloquently about morality and justice. So I thank you again for uh, your time. And I did want to just elaborate a little, because when I become anxious, I become curt in my manner. And that's really not who I am. Thank you. Thank you.